Are we live? Not quite. Good morning everybody on Facebook world. Um, we will start very shortly so we have a couple more minutes to wait. We're running slightly behind schedule this morning. I do apologize but we'll be with you very shortly. Good morning everybody and welcome to the Sunday program for the Tibetan Buddhist Society of Canberra. Uh, it is a little bit past 11 so um, I apologize for the slightly late start. We'll get underway very soon. Uh, just letting everybody know that we are live here in the, our Holder Centre at the Grant Cameron Community Centre and the intention is that we would try and have these Sunday programs returning to sort of pre-COVID conditions where we do meet here face to face uh, every Sunday. So if you wish to join uh, face to face, nine times out of ten we'll be live here at the Holder Centre. I can't guarantee every single Sunday, but and thank you for those who are with me this morning. So we might start with uh, the prayers. We, uh, we always generate bodhicitta and take refuge in some fashion or another at the beginning of any um, sort of meditation or prayer session. So that's what we'll do this morning for us. Here we're on page three. We'll read the first paragraph once and the second paragraph twice. If you can join me at home, that would be fantastic. In the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha, I take refuge until enlightenment. By virtue of listening and the like, may I reach Buddhahood to aid all beings. May all beings have happiness and the cause of happiness. May they be free from suffering and the cause of suffering. May they never part from the happiness that knows no suffering. May they dwell in equanimity, free from attachment and aversion to those near and far. May all beings have happiness and the cause of happiness. May they be free from suffering and the cause of suffering. May they never part from the happiness that knows no suffering. And may they dwell in equanimity, free from attachment and aversion to those near and far. Now we will partake in some calm abiding meditation so if you get yourself into a calm, comfortable position. Mm -hmm. 
I forgot the bell again this morning like I did last week. Too many things to rearrange from previous activities. Never mind. So I like to start my own personal meditation session with three big deep breaths. For me, I feel that that brings me into my body, calms my body down, especially if we have a slow release on the exhalation. Start settling your heartbeat and your nervous system. It's a nice start to any meditation session. And after those three deep breaths, I invite the bell. We'll start the morning with some body scans. Starting from our toes, scanning upwards through our body. And here we're checking for our posture and also being grateful for the earth element which our legs represent and the stability that that brings to our practice. As we scan up our spine, we check our posture that we are sitting nice and tall. If we are in a chair, we are sitting up off the back of the chair, supporting our own weight. And again, we give thanks for the fire element and the energy that it brings to our practice. Scanning down our arms, all the way down to our hands. We check the posture again, right hand resting in the palm of the left palms facing upwards and thumbs gently touching. And we give thanks for the water element, that this brings balance to our practice. Wisdom and compassion, left and right, good and bad, dark and light. And as we scan back up to our neck and continue up to the crown of our head and over, down our forehead, eyes, nose, mouth. Again we check our posture, particularly that our chin is tucked in, aligning our head and neck and spine. And as we scan back over the top of our head we give thanks again for this air element and the wisdom and understanding that it brings to our practice. We scan back down our neck to our shoulders, arms, hands, and back up our arms, mindfully checking our posture, checking in with any pain possibly that we might want to befriend. Keep scanning down your spine, checking your posture, giving thanks, just bringing ourselves home to our body finishing off down at our toes. That's all the instruction I will give for now, so I'll leave you to do some body scans in your own individual style for the next few moments. I'll keep an eye on the time, you keep an eye on your body.
Just check back in to see where your mind is at and if it is focusing on what you want it to focus on. May I suggest in your next round of body scanning not only check for posture but check for any pain or discomfort that you might want to breathe out, let go of, relax into. Take a mini break there to attend to whatever urgently needs your attention. And now with renewed commitment, we shall return to our meditation this time with a focus on our breath just following our rounds of breathing in through our nose as we watch our inhalation notice the change between the inhalation and the calm abiding pause at the top notice the change to the exhalation and follow our breath as it exits our body all the way down to the bottom of the exhalation and observe how that changes either with another slight pause or directly into the next inhalation follow it in through our nose into our lungs watching our chest expand or abdomen expand Again, noticing the change to the pause, the change to the exhalation, 
and our body squeezing that air out of our lungs watch it exit our nostrils In the bottom of the exhalation you may start counting to keep track of your rounds of breathing so as you breathe in pause breathe out count one breathe in pause Breathe out, count two. In, noticing, watching, following. Breathe out, three. Continue that in your own individual style. Remembering to take a mini break as you need it attend any urgent matters. A deliberate mini break is better than trying to push through and meditating for longer than you should because that mini break allows for you to reset with deliberate focus to another bout of mindful breathing. I'll leave it with you now for a few moments to follow your breath. Still checking in from time to time with your posture, ensuring your body is in the right position, right down to a slight smile on your lips.
have yourself a mini break there and again attend to what might need your attention. Several short bouts of productive meditation is better than pushing through and trying to do half an hour of agitated meditation that maybe leaves you not wanting to return. So the mini breaks are just as important as the breathing. For the final section of this morning's Karma Body Meditation, we'll stay with the breath and this time we'll visualize some colors and some energy movement. So on the incoming breath we visualize a very bright white light and traveling on that white light is positive energy. You can label it whatever you like, love, compassion, friendship, or just see it as positive, energized nutrients from the universe. And as we breathe in, that pure, blindingly white light fills our body, fills our lungs. As we reach the top of the inhalation, it changes to red and expands rapidly to every part of our body, every cell, every corner. And it infuses that positive energy into our body. And as we breathe out, we can visualize a very dark blue or dark brown smoke type color leaving our body. Drifting off into the universe and disappearing from out of sight. And on that dark cloud, we can place negative energy whatever it is you feel you need to release today, put it on that cloud. So as we breathe in the white light and the positive energy, see it, feel it coming into your body and know that you can request from the universe. As we reach the calm abiding, feel it rush to all corners of your body. See it fill your body with a red, beautiful red light and know that it's infused into every cell. And then as you exhale that dark color, see it, see the negative energy leaving your body. Watch it drift off into the universe. Know that you can just let it go. and feel it leaving your body. Drop your shoulders, relax, feel the burden lifting. So on the inhalation, see it, feel it, know it. On the exhalation, see it, feel it, know it. Again, I will leave you to your own individual, personal interpretation of this part of the breathing. I will watch the time. You watch the movement of energy.
I invite you now to quickly check in on your posture. Once you've quickly checked that, return to your breathing. As the sound of the bell that I have invited to ring for us disappears, bring your attention back into your room, back here with us. I thank you for allowing me to lead you this morning in this meditation practice. It is a privilege for me. On page 9 we have a short verse to request teachings. According to the intelligence and predisposition of each being, we ask that you turn the Dharma wheel of great, low and common vehicles. And before I forget, I will mention that um, Daylight Savings here in the eastern corner of Australia finishes very shortly. I think it's even next Saturday. Not 100% sure on that. But um, 
you might want to check times if you're not in our local time here and you um been joining in at the start of this at 10 o'clock in your local time zone then either next Sunday or the one after that for sure um, will our time zones will align so my talk today I thought I would talk a little bit about the Sangha being one third of the triple gem it's rather an important element of Buddhism fairly important in most um, traditions and religious faiths to be honest from Christianity, Islam, Hinduism so that's something we have in common across uh, faiths let me start by reading out a passage that I got from uh, Venerable Thich Nhat Hanh Vietnamese Zen master he says alone we are vulnerable but with brothers and sisters to work with we can support each other. We cannot go to the ocean as a drop of water. We would evaporate before reaching our destination. But if we become a river, if we go to the Sangha, we are sure to arrive at the ocean. You need a Sangha. You need a brother or sister or friend to remind you what you already know. The Dharma is in you, but it needs to be watered in order to manifest and become a reality. A Sangha is a community of resistance, resisting the speed, violence and unwholesome ways of living that are prevalent in our society. In society much of our suffering comes from feeling disconnected from one another. Being with the Sangha can heal these feelings of isolation and separation. We practice together, share a room together, eat side by side, clean pots together, just by participating with other practitioners in the daily activities we can experience a tangible feeling of love and acceptance. A Sangha is a garden full of many varieties of trees and flowers. When we can look at ourselves and at others as beautiful unique flowers and trees we can truly grow to understand and love one another. One flower may bloom early in the spring, another flower may bloom late in summer. One tree may bear many fruits, another tree may offer cool shade. No one plant is greater or lesser or the same as any other plant in the garden. Each member of the Sangha also has unique gifts to offer to the community. We each have areas that need attention as well. When we can appreciate each member's contributions and see our weaknesses as potential for growth, we can learn to live together harmoniously. Our practice is to see what we are, what we are flowering or fruiting as the tree in that garden. So allow me to swiftly realize my great determination to love and understand all beings. That's from Thich Nhat Hanh. And I know it's a rather long passage, but I thought he said it so beautifully that there's no way I'm going to try and put that into my own words. I think that sets up my talk beautifully of what a Sangha is all about. It's a community of practice. We each bring our own individual skills. Um, and of course, we each bring our own individual needs and flaws, if I can use that word. And I guess that's also what makes it beautiful, is that the diversity, the different people we meet and the different things we get introduced to in that Sangha, and to me is rather, rather beautiful. Sometimes a little frustrating, I know, but then I catch myself and I go, no, they're the things that make, make the Sangha beautiful. So what, what is the Sangha? Well, first of all, let me say that even though it's spelt with an A, it's not Sanger, because that's an Aussie sandwich. So we're not talking here today about Aussie sandwiches. We're talking about a Sangha. It has three different meanings from what I've been able to find out. It's all those who have become enlightened following the Buddha's teachings. It's all those who have taken the vows to become monks or nuns, your bhikkhus or bikinis, bhikkhunis, pardon me. And it's also the community of lay people who follow the teachings of the Buddha. 
So I know in some traditions it's common to recite the three refuges at the start of any sort of Buddhist event or activity. I take refuge in the Buddha, I take refuge in the Dharma, and I take refuge in the Sangha. So what does it mean to take refuge in the Sangha? Well, it's, it's a place that you really should be able to be safe from a very literal perspective. It's somewhere where we care for each other and look after each other. If somebody falls ill, then there's some practical help, some practical literal support that you will be able to, to get. And I believe that's the same within nearly all faith um, traditions that, you know, if you're, if you're ill in hospital or can't get out of bed, then someone from your, your sangha, your community, your congregation um, might check in on you. It's also somewhere where you can practice with like-minded people. People who believe the same, or at least similar, can share their experiences of, of their practice and what they've been going through and what, uh, what you might be going through. So you can discuss your practice and what might be next or what might you do better or even getting rid of those thoughts altogether about what is better and what is next and just being open to the flow of life and the unfolding. So it's somewhere we can learn the techniques, learn the, the Dharma, the theory, but also on the other side protect, protect the Dharma. Make sure it stays alive. I mean, how did it pass through generation after generation down lineage lines for the last two and a half thousand years if it wasn't for the Sangha? It would have vanished uh, off the face of this planet if it wasn't for the Sangha. It's a place where we can just be ourselves, just sit, be quiet, and share the experience. It's a sacred organization, I suppose, or element of Buddhism. But what makes it sacred? Well, simply because we place importance on it. That's really all that makes anything sacred in the Buddhist tradition. We've placed importance on it for the last two and a half thousand odd years. And we'll continue to place that importance on it. And as long as we respect it and show it uh, the respect that it deserves because of what it's done and what it can do, then it will, will remain sacred. So it has a number of sort of practical um, positives and a number of uh, spiritual positives, I suppose to allow you to practice, to allow you to feel and be in a safe place, to experience and grow and unfold. It's like a safety net, I suppose. It can be a little intimidating at first. This is what we might need to keep in mind for new people who come along and think about joining. Because in some environments, I mean, just look at what's behind me. It can seem a little daunting with the colour, with the, the different... Uh, statues and symbology and pictures and paintings. For someone who doesn't understand what all this means or why we have it or comes from a different tradition, it can very well seem a little daunting. Uh, when to bow, who to bow to, how far to bow, exactly how to bow. Do I, should I, if I'm going to uh, cause offence, if I do or don't. You know, there's many questions that the, the newcomer has. So, as a member of the Sangha, I think it's important for all of us to welcome new people, to settle them, to show them that um, what are the basics and what's sort of expected, what could possibly cause offence, how to sit, how to bow, if bowing is part of your tradition, which here it obviously is, and all of those basic sort of things, so that they feel comfortable and supported. Um, just welcoming them, learning each other's names, those sorts of things will create a sense of togetherness, a sense of belonging and support. 
few of the basic rules I've been able to determine is that we need to encourage diversity, as I've already sort of mentioned. Ask questions in a neutral manner without putting a little bit of bias or judgment on there. But at the same time, we can be genuinely curious about each other. So what brings you along here? Have you, you know, did you come from another faith? What, what makes you interested in Buddhism? We can be genuinely curious and honest as long as we ask those questions from an intention of, of genuine curiosity. It's a good idea to only speak from your own personal experiences. So when you're talking to other mem members, try to remember to say, this is what I've experienced, or this is what I do, this is what I like or don't like or enjoy, this is how I go about it. Because trying to speak from someone else's perspective, we're never going to get at the true story. You're never really going to understand. Plus, it could be sometimes a little offensive. Now generally, we don't offer advice unless, again, from our personal experience. So when I've been in this situation, I did this and it worked for me in this way. Or unless the, the other person asks for it. Maybe they're, they are genuinely struggling and you can see that they're struggling. So you may possibly ask them if they would like to hear your story about that situation. So you're not directly giving advice and you're not just blurting it out. You're asking permission and you're still giving advice or guidance from your personal perspective. So in this way we honour each person's sort of contribution to the Sangha and their opinion. So again, this contributes towards building that, that safety net that I keep talking about. So in sharing what is given, we need to hold that carefully as well. So if other people of our, in our Sangha um, express personal issues, uh, maybe some person, personal difficulties that they're happening, that's happening to them at the moment, you need to treat that as a bit of a protected conversation. Because again, it all comes down to this sense of belonging and safety. So we need to know that what we mention and what we talk about, again, because it's from our personal experience, as I mentioned just briefly before, we know that that needs to be held carefully and honorably. So when we're, when we're out in the street with other community organizations or at work, we don't talk about personal issues that we've heard in our Sangha. And this fits into our, our five precepts as well in the eight, Eightfold, um, Noble Eightfold Path. So I'm not telling you anything new here. We need to respect each other is, is what it comes down to and help each other join in. So again, from a practical sense, if we have a family arrive and they have young young people with them consider offering to support that young person for a while so that the parents can sit in silence or in, in meditation and get um, the full experience of their their time in the Sangha as well um, some more of the practicalities that I sort of thought about were to arrive early and get yourself prepared. That not only respects the sacred environment that it is, but also respects yourself and your practice. So arriving early, as I didn't do this morning clearly, forgetting to the bell and other things. So we can all do better on this front. But arriving early allows you to take some breaths, allows you to sit for a moment and be more receptive to whatever practice might happen that day. So to close off, I'll say that the Sangha is a community that lives in harmony and awareness. Your teachers, your friends and yourself are all elements of the Sangha. It's a path in the forest, which might be you know, a mum member of your Sangha as well, supporting you on that path, on that path of transformation and growth. You can share your joys and your difficulties with your Sangha. You can let go and relax into the warmth and strength of your Sangha. 
Sangha is like a river, flowing and bending with flexibility, responding to the environment in which it is situated. You can take refuge in your Sangha. We join in the stream of life, flowing and becoming with one another, our brothers and sisters in the practice. In the setting up of the Sangha, in the continuing, and I guess sometimes in the dissolving. So Sangha used to be just ordained monastics, but now it really has many different elements to it. And I know of some of Buddhist traditions that are all female. And I know of one that is focused on LGBTQI plus members. Uh, Rain Bodhi, if you're interested. You might want to look up Rain Bodhi on Google. So obviously they don't say to people who don't fit into any of those um, spectrums or categories that you, you can't join, but they focus more so on, on those um, individuals and to provide a specific safety environment for them, which I find um, wonderful. So this is all I wanted to say about the Sangha today. I wanted to sort of remind you more, I suppose, because I'm, I'm hopeful that we all know of what I've, I've mentioned today. I, I really just wanted to remind people and myself about the power and the beauty of a Sangha and why it is one third of the Triple Gem. Hopefully this has been um, of use to you this morning. And if anybody has any questions or comments, feel free to put them in the text box and we can have a quick chat about them. Or if there are any questions here or comments you'd like to share. Otherwise, I will uh, close with the dedication of our merit. So on page 10... By this merit, may we overcome the defilements and gain omniscience. May I liberate all beings from the ocean of birth, old age, sickness and death. Hearing the Mahayana teachings, whatever merit I have accrued, may all beings become stainless vessels to hold the Mahayana teachings. Courageous Menjushri knew all things, and Saman Tabraja did likewise. Following of all their examples, I shall dedicate all these merits. May the excellent body cheetah take birth where it has not yet done so. Where it has been born, may it increase freely without degeneration. Thank you very much and go well. Thank you. Lovely to see you here again. Very, very nice that you found out we were open again. Yeah, that's good. Thank you very much. Appreciate you coming along. I uh, appreciate everybody's time at home. Go and enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Next week, next week, Venerable Jem Young will be talking only on Facebook, unfortunately. He's not able to get into uh, the Holder Centre. But the week after that, we'll be back in personal person here in the Holder Centre and on Facebook. So I look forward to um, seeing you all again. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.